Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the show. I'm so delighted to introduce my my latest guest. This is the great Stephen Heiner. He is a Roman Catholic entrepreneur and the founder of True Restoration. I mean, that's that's an organization. I don't know how many hours I've watched their content and binged on Bishop Sanborn content and Father Chiqueda. And it's all thanks to this gentleman, you know, really an important person, I think, for, um, who's really helped uh, my journey. And so I'm really glad to, to be able to speak to him today. So Stephen, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you very much for that very generous uh, introduction. And uh, I, I am glad to be able to enable the binging that I wish I had had. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 you know, in many ways, Stephen, uh, as I listen to your interviews, I almost see myself in your position when I'm there. I, I think like, yeah, that's exactly what I would ask if as, as you're going through all these important topics. And again, you know, I, would, I want to just share the link to True Restoration. It's really a, and a wonderful uh, media site, content, blog, uh, articles, podcasts video, really tremendous. And I really recommend anyone who is new to the Catholic faith to definitely check it out. And so, Stephen, like I was saying, um, I think your journey is a great model for a lot of people. Tell me your story. Uh, you, you started, you had quite a journey. So why didn't you tell me about it? Yeah. And I, I reflect with some of the, the younger folks these days who are going through this, that they definitely took shortcuts that I wish that I had taken, but mine follows a very conventional path that is less conventional, I think, for the younger crowd. I think the younger crowd see the problem and set of a is more obvious. And I took a more conventional path, I think probably as the internet was still becoming part of our the way that we find information in our society. So we, I grew up conservative in Nova Sordo in Singapore, which is where the last time you and I had a chance to meet was. <laughs> and I was there until I was nine years old. And all, I was you know, ser serving Monday night masses at Novena Church, which is this very big, uh, big Nova Sordo church in, in Singapore. And the same thing continued when we moved to the United States. My father would try to find the most conservative Nova Sordo parish in a given diocese or archdiocese. And we would go there, even if it was you know, a 30 minute drive away from our a house or apartment, whatever it might be. And uh, there's there's a famous, I can't take credit for it, but this is called Roman Catholic, like you're roaming around. Um, so we were, <laughs> we, we, were, we, were, we were Roman Catholic in those days. And this included a year in the Byzantine Rite. And I have a great love and appreciation for the Byzantine Rite and the Eastern Rites of the Church because of my, our one year sojourn there. A very beautiful, ancient, older, you know, I know Romans don't want to hear this, but it's older than our liturgy, uh, the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. But um, the Roman rite is still a very beautiful and venerable rite that I'm very attached to. And at some point, there was a conversation at my conservative Nova Sordo high school with uh, a fellow a fellow kid uh, at, at the equivalent of recess, but it's break when you're older, right? It was right. a month, you know. Uh, 10 minute break and we were talking about Vatican II and I repeated the party line which the the Orange County Norbertines had taught me when I was at their high school which is Vatican II was basically just some updating uh, translation from Latin to English no real essentials have changed we, we hate that there's some disrespect shown some quote-unquote abuses like communion in the hand but Vatican II was mostly an update. And he laughed in my face, this 16, 17-year-old kid. And he said, you have no idea what you're talking about. And at that time, as I, I, I think, uh, I, I hope I still have this spirit today. I thought, okay, well, you know, what do you have to show me? And he gave me a couple books. Um, one was Open Letter to Confused Catholics by Archbishop Lefebvre. And another was What Has Happened to the Catholic Church, which are by the Radecki brothers, uh, their priests of the CMRI. And I... I was shocked by what I read and it started me down a path, which first got uh, my family to come to the indult mass. There, there was no resistance. My family, we had already been primed by searching out conservative Nova Sordo. So there was no resistance to, okay, well, let's check out this indult mass. Everyone in my family liked it. They were a little lost. 
they were, you know, they hadn't had the Latin background that I had had in high school, but they were caught up by the reverence of it. They loved the sermon. And this was by an old, a valid priest um, who was doing the, the Latin mass. So there wasn't a question of validity. I, at the time, I had no idea about validity, invalidity, but he, he was a valid priest saying the traditional mass uh, under the so-called diocesan indult. But I just kept reading. This is the problem once you go down the rabbit hole. <laughs> and before too long, I was at the SSPX in Los Angeles, which was a chapel that had been paid for in part by Mel Gibson and was run by oh. a, a, also an old, a older priest. Okay. Before Mel, before Mel Gibson went home alone and whatever else, he, he paid mm. uh, Monsignor Donahue at the time. I think he paid in part for this church. Monsignor Donahue, quite eccentric. He would he 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 was before my time, so I went to that chapel when it was in the mm. SSP in the hands of the SSPX. But there was a legal tussle between SSPX and SSPV for that chapel because Monsignor Donahue, like many of these old retiring priests, tried to play both sides. He would try to you know say set of a contest things and then sometimes say SSPX friendly things. And right. if you look at the history of these chapels in the United States, it's always a disaster. Very rarely have these these ended well because the priests fail to take a strong principled stand and hence provide for succession. They just thought, well, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing, be popular with my people, forgetting that one, one day they're going to die and that their yeah, people you know, need to uh, be provided Stephen, for. I mean, that's, that's the one, you know, it, when I granted, I'm so new to this, but I mean, what kind of uh, pretzel must you put your mind through if you want to kind of accept um, the, the 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 just the inherent contradiction of of what's going on and what is the doctrine the traditional doctrine and just trying to have and people seem to just are okay with that but I I realized just coming in fresh like wait a second why are they okay with this well all of the all of our clerics always talk about this Latin massism that whether we like it or not a lot of people are sentimentally attached to Catholicism or the faith. And there's no question of principles. So the question is, why am I here? Why do I believe what I believe? What is it that I actually believe? What are my principles? And so when people just say, oh, the Latin mass, it's so beautiful, and they just fall right. all over themselves for it. Uh, the perfect case study for this would be the former Benedictine monastery in Alabama, which was run by Abbot, Abbot Leonard Giardina, Father Chicada wrote a very good summary of the situation when um, Father Giardina passed away, or Father Leonard, I should say. Religious are addressed by their first names, not their last names. And that monastery imploded uh, because mm. there were there were monks on both sides who were there. There were monks who were, let's say, a little bit more diocesan friendly, and monks mm. who were set of a contest. And uh, Abbot Leonard never took a stance because that would have curtailed. And I, I, I'm not trying to speak ill uh, because I, I just understand the practicality of it. There's mm -hmm. more money when you take an ambiguous stance. And I think his idea was, mm -hmm. I want to build up this foundation and then maybe in the future we could, we could do something with it. But he, we all know those of us who are set of a concept that there's no money in it, <laughs> Right. So no. if they if he were if he were to come out instead of a contest, not only would he have lost the number of vocations, but he would have lost the number of benefactors. And we have to attribute, at least humanly speaking, that is a reasonable reason why he may have done it. I'm not trying to justify it, but Father Chicada alludes to that in that article. So I would, I would invite people to look at that and see this is what happens when you create a chapel, an independent chapel, um, with no principles, no ties to anyone else, no plans for succession. That it only lasts as long as the founder which makes it sound a little bit like a cult that mm. uh, if you can't, if you don't have something that can last past its founder, then it's, it's nothing really. So it's just I, personality I, driven at that point. Exactly. Exactly. And, and Bishop Dolan used to talk about this all the time, the, 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 the P's, the psychosis. And I forget, mm. I forget all the P's that he talked about, but part of it was personality. And I, I went to SSPX and this created a, a non-ironically schism in my family because my dad and I, my dad and I went to SSPX and for 90 days, I basically labored with my mom every Sunday. She, she kept going to the adult with my sisters and I kept trying to explain to her how the SSPX was not schismatic, right? Arguments that I would cringe to repeat now out loud mm. because they're so ridiculous. But right. at the time I finally won my mom over and I would say, 
um, if you're familiar with the trail, Americans, there's a game in the 80s called Oregon Trail. And you get to the end and the game ends and, and you win. And we were at the end of the Oregon Trail. We were at the SSPX Chapel. My sisters went to the school. Um, we, my mom volunteered. That was it. We are no more Roman Catholics. We were settled in. And I would say all of us as a family continued in that line for a decade, right? So from mm -hmm. 1997 to roughly 2006, Mm -hmm. And this included my sisters going to the boarding school, St. Mary's, Kansas. I spent a year at the college in St. Mary's, Kansas. And eventually my parents would move to St. Mary's and my whole family is now in St. Mary's, Kansas, all attending Mass of mm -hmm. the SSPX where they're about to open their, I don't know, $75 million church that they just built in, in St. Mary's. Wow. And wow. where my journey diverged and where they thought, oh, Stephen's going through a phase and I became the black sheep of the family because we couldn't, we couldn't, we couldn't go to mass together anymore was a fateful interview I made with Bishop Tissier de Malaray, who is one of the SSPX bishops. Mm -hmm. And he had a real reputation for uh, canon law and theological matters. He was part of the commission that was for many years dealing, quote unquote, negotiating with Rome, trying to work out theological differences. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, he's coming to California. I'm going to be in California. I could maybe do an interview with him and be featured in The Remnant. Mm -hmm. So I queried Michael Matt on it at the time. And he said, sure, if you, sure, kid, if you can get it, I'll run it in The Remnant, <laughs> et cetera. I said, I just want to retain rights to run it on True Restoration. Well, little did I know this interview was going to blow up in a huge mm -hmm. way, um, in part because Bishop Tissier hijacked the interview away from my very inexperienced hands. So I had asked him some basic questions about the general chapter, mm -hmm. uh, Our Lady of Fatima. If you, if you, their interview is still available on the web if you go look it up. But so you, you at, were just doing a regular interview. You weren't expecting there, like... it, it, was, it, it was soft. <laughs> it was softball. I want you to think of like a People magazine. Interview, right. You were not uh, expecting the, a nuclear bomb. Well, it, it, in part because I, my head, my headspace wasn't there. I wasn't thinking about the problems which he would bring up. What was weird was he's the one who brought it up and then he changed my life completely. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was due to me trying to wrap up the interview. And he says, but you haven't asked any important questions. And, and I, I, I wasn't insulted. You know, if I had probably been paying yeah. more attention, I, I would have, oh, I'm a little bit salty, Your Excellency. Um, but it was, uh, well, what important questions? And he says, well, that Benedict XVI is a heretic and that he's still a heretic. <laughs> and, okay, I start taking notes. I start, I, you know, and I switch into full journalist mode now mm. of following up. He, he says something, I keep following up. And he would give a long quote. He would and quote you're something trained, from... And you're trained in English, right, uh, Stephen? You've my, 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 under, my, my, my undergraduate degree is in literature. But let's right. say I've I've done on the job training as a journalist, right, and right. and learned and learned it over the years by having many wonderful subjects to work with. But right. I just start going down the rabbit hole with him, and he he says things, and I'm following, and then I I'm shell shocked. He ends the interview because he has to go to the confession. I could have kept going. He has to go <laughs> uh, hear confessions, uh, and I I am in the parking lot. I call my friend my an SSPX friend who we'd gone in Ignatian retreat together mm. and we're still friends to this day. And I said, um, I said, uh, Bishop Tissier just called Ben the 16th, a heretic, like more than a dozen times in my interview. And, and he was not as disturbed by it because many SSPX people are perfectly fine with calling Francis a heretic. That doesn't mm. bother them. There are no consequences for that. Um, they'll say something like he's an undeclared heretic or it, because it's the same thing of they call Joe Biden or Nancy Pelosi a heretic. They have no problem saying that, but they just don't think there's any consequences behind that. There are no consequences behind someone being a heretic and being the Pope. For me, yeah. that was an immediate problem. How is it possible that someone could be the Pope and a heretic? And I, and I didn't know the answer to that. I really didn't. Right. And so the person just, who I knew would... I just sorry, Stephen, but I just I remember that was a thing for me. And a lot of people, it's like this idea of bad popes that that seems to push away a lot of people. Then there's that difference between a heretic pope and someone who's personally sinful. But this is dealing with something that is beyond personal sin. This is someone who's actually teaching error 
in the most important uh, position in the Catholic Church. Right. And you have to realize the impact on me was I had really, uh, the whole reason I'd interviewed this bishop in the first place, because I had so much respect for him. He'd really garnered an international reputation for scholarship, um, earned or not. I can, we can talk about that a a separate time, but he, he, he held a, a a high place in in my mind regarding this and that he thinks he said it without doubt. He hijacked the interview and said, Benedict XVI is a heretic. Let me tell you how. Right. And later on, when I sent him the interview, because I always gave all of my subjects mm. final writer review on what I published, he went through the manuscript and he crossed out heretic and changed it to professed heresies. But there is no, I think he was just more comfortable with the phrasing, whether in English or in French, it wasn't clear to him. But professing heresies is the same thing as being a heretic, but maybe right. professing heresies sounds softer, who knows? But in any case, I knew I knew about who I knew who Father Chicada was because I knew that set of a consism wasn't possible. Right. So he was in the impossible he, he was in the impossible camp. You were aware but, of him. He, he was there in the in the intellectual yes, sphere. Yes, because all, all SSPX people have to be made clear that set of a consism is for crazy people. <laughs> and here's here's all the reasons why. But because I was intellectually curious, I at least mm-hmm. knew who the names of some of these set of accounts were. And I read had read some of their articles, maybe on some safer things like liturgy, where mm-hmm. there's no danger in reading set of accounts articles about liturgy because you can go, yeah, right on. That's that that's correct. Mm-hmm. Uh, without without <laughs> uh, w- without worrying yourself. So I called Father Chicada, and I said, hey. Father, I've read your your works. Uh, they're very interesting. I'm not a set of a contest. Oh, by the way, you. to call a set of a cantist priest, did you have any kind of like, oh no, what am I doing? Am I going into enemy territory? Am I? Did you have any feelings like that? Keep, keep in mind, my brain had already exploded with the idea <laughs> of the Pope being a heretic, right? So right. if you can imagine an egg exploded and I'm looking at the pieces, I'm trying to figure out how to put this back together. And I thought, right. well, maybe a set of a contest priest can give me some crazy argument so that maybe I can be persuaded that this is fine. I just didn't know the answer to this question. And the fact that if you have to keep in mind, he would be senior clergy in the SSPX. So if you yeah. consider all the bishops of the SSPX equal and that he was the one who was sent, who was delegated uh, to work on this theological problem with Rome, then who else is going to be superior yeah. to him? I see like it, yeah. one, two, <laughs> one or two or three people. So right. I just thought, if he thinks that the Pope can be a heretic, maybe there's an answer to this. Mm. And so that was the driving question. I really, I didn't see the larger implications. I just wanted an answer to this question. And I suppose if you look at my journey, it follows, it follows my father's journey to keep us with, you know, conservative Novus Ordos is we were just, we were searching. We were Mm. on a mission to find what was right. And for me, it was, can a Pope be a heretic? That was a simple question. And Father Chicada, if you know Father Chicada, and those of who are listening to this know, I want you to imagine, and this could be, uh, if you're from the Commonwealth world, this would be a slow uh, bowl towards uh, a batsman. In cricket, in, in, in America, it would be like a soft pitch baseball. Asking <laughs> Father Chicada, is it possible for a Pope to be a heretic? You know, that is the easiest question. And Father is just waiting for that. But here's the wonderful thing. I didn't know this man at all. And he answered yeah. me with so much kindness, courtesy, humor. This mm-hmm. is always what most of us who've interacted with Father we, from day one, he didn't know me from anybody was just, he would just say, no, it's not possible. <laughs> and let me tell you the ways. And that really started an 18 month journey for me. So that was April, 2006. And I just started reading everything on traditionalmass.org, which is still a treasure. If people are getting started here, go and read everything on traditionalmass.org. You're going to be uh, really, really blown away. And that led to a later project, which is coming back into print later this year, the Anti-Modernist Reader, volume one which is on the papacy that's coming back into print uh, this year, later this year, we've, we've sold out of that before. Now who and runs traditional mass.org? That was, that's Father Chicada's, but okay. it features articles from Bishop Sanborn and Bishop Dolan, and even some IABC priests like Dom, Father Ricosa's articles are there. So I, I don't know. I, 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 there's sort of an open question, and this was something Bishop Dolan and I were talking about before his death, was updating some of the articles, just mm-hmm. some of the, I don't know if it's a WordPress site, but things had broken over the years with some punctuation. And I said, hey, if I could get in there, but it might have been Father Chicago had a password. 
and mm. we need to, but it's still a functional resource. So I don't want to worry mm. people that it's going to blow up one day. I don't think that's the case. <laughs> I just think it's an, it's an aging website that we need to refresh. Right. And I'd be happy, I'd be happy to help with that. So I, I was reading everything there. And at some point I realized I am definitely a set of incontents and it scared, <laughs> it's scared, it's scared, it scared yeah. the heck out of me because I had built a 10 year infrastructure of SSPX friends. Right. And, and that's during the so, reign of, of uh, Benedict the 16th, who is very much perceived as an ex- conservative Pope. So it's it's almost some, like some, I mean, J- some it, JP two, some bending the sixteenth, yes. And, and for instance, uh, when people convert to set of Vaticanism or pre Vatican II Catholicism today, as a reaction to Francis, I mean that's it's so it's a lot easier in a way to kind of see because in a way Francis makes it easy for somebody. But I I, I think for you, Stephen, it must have been a lot harder because the perception of Benedict the sixteenth is he's the guy who saved the Latin Mass. And he was this super conservative uh, Catholic figure. If 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 that had happened while I was, I'm trying to remember. Was spending the 16th like 2000, 2011, 12? I feel like he was a little he was a little bit past this period. So it might have been JP two for me. But okay. I would say similarly, you realize you have to realize that JP two was the great, the amazing. The, oh right, yeah. Uh, the right. the fighter of orthodoxy. So, a 2005, 2005 to 2013. Okay, you, so you're you're absolutely right. Um, I must. I think probably what it was was JP two was so dominant in my mind prior right. that it, in 2006 when I'm starting to go through these difficulties, the idea that Benedict the Sixteenth would would save us was a problem given JP 2s legacy that Benedict the 16th was not divorcing himself from this. And so while some people took heart, I remember having a three-way call with a couple friends at the con, you know, after the conclave finished and they're like, and one of my friends was very bullish. He's like, yeah, this is when the fight back starts. B16, watch out, baby. And, and I just thought, I said, I said, you know, he, uh, I, I'm. I don't think that that's going to be the case. But he fulfilled a lot of the fantasies of the indult SSPX crowd with the uh, the red shoes, and I think he even wore a tiara once or twice, just purely purely for fashion. There wasn't any ceremony with it, mm-hmm. but but I did not know as much about him in those early days. I really had to learn. There was a really good episode, two episodes that I did with Father Jakarta and Bishop Sanborn there available for for free online uh the legacy of benedict the 16th it was a two-part episode that we did before we did our very first episode on jorge bergoglio and that was just based on what we found on the internet lighting candles with the jews and and before before we would get any of the other choice quotes that he would have when he put on a on a white cassock we already knew from day one this person was a problem and when we would get to jorge bergoglio but but yes, Benning the Sixteenth was loomed large and was this figure for for Chad's. But I would say that that wasn't the problem for me. It was that I had had all of these SSPX friends, and all of us bought the same lie, which was, "It's okay. The Pope is a bad dad. We're in in spite of his badness. We we the chosen few are carrying on, even though the man who we consider to be the Vicar of Jesus Christ on Earth considers us suspended." at least ambiguous. We say that we're in union with him, even though he says that we're not in union with him. And uh, Bishop Sam would always say, you know, in order for John to be with Mary, Mary has to be with John. And mm. so if John says he's with Mary and Mary says, I'm not with John. So it's this idea <laughs> that SSPX would say we're with Rome and Rome would either always either give ambiguous answers or not clear. It was mm. at least problematic. But a lot of us would hold on to that ambiguity as proof that, whatever uh, the deep church wouldn't allow the Mm. imprisoned Holy Father to say the real thing. And so after that period of me struggling, realizing, okay, I accepted set of Econsism as correct. What would happen is now at coffee and donuts after mass, I would start to get in arguments with people about (laughs) Vatican II, because this was where the problem really starts is once you identify that Vatican II is the beginning, the birth of a new religion, then you realize that anything connected to that religion, including these these claimants, are problematic. 
Um, but I was still going to mouse with the SSPX. And I've documented this in other articles uh, online, but I effectively researched and eight out of every eight or nine out of every 10 people I asked, both uh, clerical and lay people told me it was okay to go to mass with the SSPX, even though you're a set of contest. The SSPX, unless you're out distributing set of contest flyers, they don't care either. They really don't. And I know that because there are still there are still known set of accounts to attend. There's a there's a known set of accounts several in St. Mary's where my family lives who go, go to mass with the SSPX, but they claim to be set of accounts and Can have all sorts say, of. Somebody you say know, um, that there's several there's a number in the SSPX who are basically practicing set of accountants, but just not they just don't do it officially. <laughs> Can, can, can we call someone who attends mass with the SSPX a practicing instead of a contest? I would say sure. they are, as, they are aspiring instead of a contest with no, <laughs> with no will, with no willpower. It's easy mm-hmm. to say you're a set of a contest, but being a set of a contest means that you accept the logical conclusions. And so some people will recently, there was an argument, okay, Father Chicago made a mistake in this article and it's about undeclared heretics. I'm like, okay, well, Francis is an undeclared heretic. So I guess you can just go there. So this idea that mm-hmm. it's okay, it's okay to have an undeclared, uh, you don't have to have a declaration for Francis, but you do in order to not be able to go to mass. And I just think people are grasping the straws here. You didn't, our Lord never said you must go to mass in order to be saved. You have to keep the faith. Going to mass assists us in keeping the faith, but we have examples all around us, both in recent times and in the ancient past of Catholics, Christians, who kept the faith without access to the mass, without access to any of the goods that we have today. We have access to the scapular. We have access to the rosary. Do you think the, you think the martyrs of the Colosseum had access to the rosary? Did they have access to the scapular? Mm-hmm. They probably didn't even have access to the mass at times. Somehow, I don't know how, but they managed to be saved. So there's mm-hmm. this, this creation, which the SSPX has fostered, which is I must go to mass. And this is a lie. It's an obligation. You only miss mass if you have a mass to miss. And the idea that I would go to mass with the SSPX and hear a sermon about our Holy Father and how we need to resist the Holy Father. And then I'm supposed to take my children, if I have children, to a mass in which the priest preaches resistance to the Holy Father. And that this is good and nourishing for my Catholic faith is absolutely crazy to me. But right. at the time, it was the it still is to this day the minority position, sadly, among set of contests, it's the minority position that you cannot go to Unicum masses. But at mm-hmm. the time, Bishop Sanborn, Father Chicago, and Bishop Dolan were the only clergy who were telling me, you can't do this. And their arguments seemed so clear to me. And I was looking for them to be refuted. I went around asking these lay people, asking these other clergy, uh, and and they would just give me sentimental arguments. They didn't really give me anything that resonated in the same way. And all of Father Chicada and Bishop Dolan's stuff is up there in Italian and French. We have uh, Father Ricosa's got an excellent little pamphlet that's about 50 pages, which I'm hoping to bring into English. But to this day, from 2008, when I became, uh, well, 2008, 2009, 2010 is when I went on my non unicum journey. And that's when mass stopped for me. I was going to Mass for 10 years, every Sunday, Holy Days of Obligation, Saturdays, First Fridays, and I realized effectively that light turned out for me. And I would occasionally, the CMRI had a chapel about three hours north of Kansas City, and I would occasionally go there. Mm -hmm. But that would be like once a month, once every couple months, because it was a three-hour drive each way. And that was the consequence of accepting that I'm I'm not going to, go to unicum anything you know that's a major i see that a lot it's like i you cannot deny people the sacraments they need the sacraments you i always see that kind of line also also not true yeah yeah also show me where show me where it says that in the catechism show me where it says that i i require the sacraments in order to be saved so outside of baptism right so and baptism is not something that requires priests um, it, it, ordinarily it does, but there are extraordinary circumstances which, mm. which permit it. So um, the idea that you people need the sacraments, well, that, that is a pious thought. That is certainly uh, something to be commended, but it is not required for salvation. And certainly right. not, again, outside of baptism. Um, but people get very attached to that. And that was something right. that I, I broke through on. So, You know, uh, I'm always fascinated with organizations and their head. Now, this is a major figure in the traditional movement. Of course, Archbishop 
uh, Marcel Lefebvre. And I think, you know, Bishop Sanborn was ordained by him. <laughs> um, just, uh, I mean, a major, major figure uh, in the, uh, obviously in, in the SSPX, the main figure. Um, but I, I I remember listening to a podcast where, uh, was it uh, Bishop Sanborn, Bishop Dolan? I, I can't remember the the people in the, in the, who are, but I think it was, it was a remembrance of, uh, Archbishop Lefebvre. We, we did that. And I was very yeah. pleased at the time because I thought it was like a world premiere getting Father Jacotta, Bishop <laughs> Dolan, and Bishop Sanborn on, right, on, right. on a call on a call together. I was well, very, that's very I important very because by three prominent uh, set of acantist, uh All ordained, uh, all ordained by the Archbishop as well. And who, knew who him, intima- him. In, intimately very closely. Yeah. So it's, it's, so do you, I mean, Father Jacotta has a video called uh, uh, Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, set of a cantist. <laughs> <laughs> and um, now, how does this play in the dynamic of talking to people in SSPX? Because on the one hand, uh, Archbishop Lefebvre said very set of a cantist things, but on the other hand, he was kind of on the other side trying to reconcile with Rome. And that uh, that un- if your leader does that, that's going to affect how, how your organization thinks. I want to be clear, and and my knowledge is somewhat dated because I haven't attended anything with the SSPX since 2008. Right? Right. And it's 2023 when we're recording this. But obviously, my entire family still goes to the SSPX, <laughs> and, and I know people who know them. So I want to be clear. The SSPX, the, the people who go to the SSPX, I think by and large are Latin masters. They like the Latin Mass. They like the beauty of Gregorian chant. They like seeing nuns in full habit. They like seeing priests in cassocks. They they like the the moral certitude of okay, we are against homosexual unions. We're against abortion. They they like all of the certitude of that. They like the the ceremonies. They like benediction. But if you scratch just a little bit, and just say what is the what what is the position of Vatican II? What is the status of the new mass? What is the what is the status of the post Vatican II popes? What what does it mean that ecumenism collegiality are taught in official documents? And you're going to hear a bunch of gobbledygook about this is a pastoral council, <laughs> and I suppose like because you know they closed their eyes and they and they didn't say a certain word on Tuesday, it doesn't count. Whatever it might be, but the average SSPX sir is not well catechized not simply in the Vatican II issues, but they're not well catechized on basics in Catholicism. That's okay. I accept that many Catholics are very busy just trying to provide for their family. And on Sundays when they may have time to relax and uh, just take a load off, they're not thinking, you know what I want to do? I want to pull a big 800 page catechism book off the the shelf and start reading. I accept, especially because I'm a single man and I observe married people I don't know how married people do it with kids. They have so much, so much that they have to give and so much that they have to account for. And so they don't necessarily have time to study the way a single man does. So when I've delved into the encyclicals or I've read catechisms or I've read canon law treatises, right? I, you know, I read a book about the index. I can go deep because I don't have any kids. I don't have a wife. I don't have those responsibilities. And so I, while I say in on one sense that a lot of, SSPX people are Latin masters and they're not well formed either doctrinally or regarding the Vatican II issues. I'm not meaning that as an insult, like, oh, you know, they're really dumb. I accept the realities that you've you found some place that's comfortable for you and you just go through life. The reason I take this further is if I were to go back into the 1940s and the 1930s, I think I would find many similar people in the pews at their mm. at their I do not think that there were uh, large numbers of men who were, you know, studying encyclicals in their free time. I do right. not think that, I don't think there were women's groups that were studying, you know, encyclicals in their free time. I just think people, everything was ordered. They went to mass on Sunday. They took their family. They went to confession. It, the, the time you could say didn't require deeper study of the faith. People have been have born, uh, lived their lives, died, became saints potentially, without ever having learned deeper things. It's not required for you to, to know the catechism deeply and be able to preach it as a Catholic. That's not the requirement. It's that right. you have to live the faith. 
live it w- within the bounds of your of your knowledge. And so when you're talking about these SSPX people, the reason why you can't have a reasonable discussion with them is they have no foundation on which to talk to you. So how can I have a conversation with someone about Vatican II who's never read a single Vatican II document? And do you mm-hmm. think that they're suddenly going to pick up a 300-page book and read because I said I wanted to have a conversation? Keep in mind, that would be the beginning of the conversation. Once they've actually read the Vatican II documents, then we could begin to have a conversation. If they don't know anything about the pre-55 Holy Week, which ironically now, Fraternity of St. Peter, Institute of Christ the King, all of these people have gone back to the pre-55 Holy Week. The, the SSPX and the CMRR are the only people who are insisting on using this uh, this basically Novus Order Holy Week. Um, I don't I don't know I don't know why the other people who are not even set of the contest they've done the research and they've come to the same conclusions that right. the whole the Novus Order Holy Week the nineteen the pre the post fifty five Holy Week that was exercise one of the new mass. So if you're refusing the new mass, you're obviously going to refuse the the new mass Holy Week. Right? The, the Novus Ordo, the, the Holy Week that's used in, for the Novus Ordo is virtually unchanged from the changes that were made. So this was a trial balloon that, that was run. And so a lot well, of people want to... Does the SSPX use um, JP2's catechism? They, they, they probably don't use it, but they, they, I don't think they can refute it. The idea is they'll, mm-hmm. they'll talk about... They, they're very much pick and choose. But the catechism of the Catholic Church has certain mm-hmm. problematic sections which right. sspx will say oh well we have a problem with this like well it's an official catechism of, of the church so mm-hmm. you can't have a problem with it it's one of those <laughs> yeah. those circuit yeah. the certain you know circular logic like how can you have a problem with the catechism that was published by the vatican are you are you nuts but once again <laughs> people people don't think through this and it, as i say i I don't fault them because it's a lot to mm-hmm. wake up in the morning go to your job raise your family get them fed, get them to mass on Sunday um, and just live uh, yeah. to, to delve into deeper questions about why is the faith this way? I think I've just over the years gotten a real understanding for people's lack of curiosity and lack of willingness to make difficult decisions. Cause even as I say, there are a set of a in St. Mary's who go to mass with the mm-hmm. SSPX. So they've just, they've, they have accepted the contradiction in their lives. And surely everyone around them who's an SSPX parishioner is asking, well, why do you go to mass with us? You know, you're, mm-hmm. they, everyone around them realizes that they're, this is crazy, but they've just, they, they have their lives there. I've got my friends, I've got my family. And the number of, of ways, just as people leave the faith over their family, people stay with SSPX because of their family. Right. And this is one of those things where I just accepted, my family thinks I'm a black sheep. And they, they provide me with such compelling arguments as, well, Stephen, don't you know that the Pope is the Pope? And I think, oh, wow, what, what an amazing argument. I'll, <laughs> that's I'll, a knockout, I'll just, knockout blow, that, yeah. That, that, that's <laughs> it. I'm just, I'm just going to give up. You know, when can I start going to Mass with the SSPX again? That, this idea that the Pope is the Pope, this, this tautology, this, this crazy circular argument. Right. That right. I, know that my, I know that my own family hasn't done the research, so I don't have a discussion with them either. If right. in order to have a real exchange of views... You have to accept that at the end of this, if you're wrong, you're going to make radical changes to your life. And right. with 99% of people you engage with on Twitter, elsewhere, the answer is no. If you right. show them that this path, you might have to quit your job, you may have to move, you may have to stop going to mass. Uh, you, you think people sign up for that every day? And I'm, not, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn because I did. I'm just saying that I accept that most people are not intellectually curious enough to dig and they're not willing to make difficult decisions. That's on them. I have I have to answer for myself in my particular judgment. I don't have to answer for anyone else, and I don't want to answer for anyone else. But I just I would exhort people who who are Latin masters to ask: Is this really what it's all about? Going to a Latin mass, having your 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 girls around some well dressed and well behaved nuns, and going on a few processions, doing some pilgrimages, going to benediction. Is is that it? Is that the faith for you? Or is it about principles? Is it about beliefs? Like, what is it that you really believe? And what is the why? Why is Vatican II such a problem? Is it because SSPX has all, has all the answers? If so, further investigation will bear this out. And this all d- dates back to you originally started this line of questioning around Archbishop Lefebvre. Yes. Most most SSPXers don't know anything about Archbishop Lefebvre. <laughs> there are two biographies that him, that exist by him. One by Bishop Tissier, more than yeah. six hundred pages, which I've read. And one by Dr. David Allen White, maybe about 350 pages, which I've read. 
my my one of my brothers, all three of my brothers in law, all of whom have attended SSPX since they were at least eleven or twelve years old, they haven't read either of those books. Mm-hmm. And and they're and they and and at least one of them wants to give me the Pope as the Pope argument. <laughs> and I'm the and I'm the one who's read more than a thousand pages uh, about Archbishop Lefebvre and his thought. I'm the one who interacts with priests who are. You've done more by work. Him. You've done more more work on their side on their position. <laughs> they don't have the freedom to necessarily go and interview priests directly, but I did, and I published it, and it's there. So I think part of why I did the work that I did was. It wasn't just a private conversation that I would have with Father Chikada. It was either recorded in print, audio, or video. And then it was there. And it said, you you watch it. You read it. You come to your own conclusions. And and so that it wasn't just me being helped. It was other people being helped. And that's why I say I'm so happy to hear other people are binging. I would have loved Absolutely. to have been, I would have loved to have binged. I had to actually create the stuff to binge on. <laughs> no, absolutely. I think, uh, and you found the, the 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 people who are really key to that. Um, now we talked a lot about SSPX, and it was you said something very interesting. You said it's a minority position, the, the non unicum, even among set of acantus. Let's talk sure. a little. Let's now focus on that. Now that's really interesting. Now I was blown. I thought, and I, I see, I, I'm so new to this. I, and I thought, oh, maybe non unicum is a new thing in the 80s, 90s, 2000s. But uh, Bishop Gerard Deloria was doing it in the what the 60s. So I mean, or, or unbelievable uh, the the foresight of this man. So it's not a it's not a modern innovation. It's something that uh, a very courageous and well studied person was already doing in the 60s. Why? Let's talk about that issue, and uh, and let's let's give me your perspective on that issue within the pre-Vatican II sphere. It's a very controversial area, of course. It, it is was because around this time last year, I was putting out the third of three articles on this issue regarding a particular religious congregation, the CMRI, whose official position is that it's okay. Now, I I knew then, and I have. I have only had it confirmed since that there are a number of CMRI priests who are as staunch on non unicum as my, when I say my clergy, the clergy I associate with from the RCI, IMBC, um, to an extent, SGG, Father Nkamuke's group in Nigeria, Father Soliman's group in the Philippines. There are people who are very staunch non unicum mm-hmm. people. And there are a number of CMRI priests that are to be counted on that. However, their private positions are countermanded by the official position. And, and to understand that, you have to realize the CMRI have have a have a past, which which it, it, it's a it's an issue that we probably don't have time to get into here. But it was one that what had crazy crazy ideas, and some of the people survived from that time period are still with the CMRI today. But it was that women had to walk backwards out of church; they had to wear absolutely ankle length uh, you know dresses, and uh, because there were such, let's say, excesses, and more than one priest has and faithful have articulated to me this this hypothesis that because the old CMRI under Shukart was so weird that Bishop Arunas has tried to be as accommodating as possible on the other on the other end to just say, hey, we aren't part of the same weird cult as before, and so part of that is his inability to say no to lay people. So since Bishop Abrunas can't tell someone no when they come up to them with dog, puppy dog eyes and say, well, you know, Your Excellency, like I can only get to Mass once a quarter and, you know, SSPX is around the corner. And Bishop Abrunas says, yeah, you can go. And so he said that to me, to my own face, personally, the last time that we, not the last time we met in person, but the, one of the first times that we met in person in 2011 in Spokane, he said that to me, to my face, that it was okay for me to go to Mass with the SSPX. He's tried to change the story with other people who questioned him about it later that uh, you know, like I had a what sandwich the, in my mouth, the, and I was just sort of casually asking. The official, asking him, the official what's the position was when, when, right when now. What's when the I, official when position? When I artic- well, strangely, if you go to the CMRI's website now, my name is up there in lights with two two responses. <laughs> one of which is an article that was written twenty years ago, and basically Bishop Provinus just dusted it off and reposted it. So his position on on Unicum has not changed for at least 20 years, which is, it's totally fine. And let me give you all the justifications why for why this is okay. And then his more recent one, which, you know, tried to, he attacked me personally, which I, I never attacked him personally. I never attacked the CMRI personally. I simply said, here's the, here's the issue. And, and it, the majority of CMRI faithful 
are were very upset <laughs> and they took it very poorly. But I still go back to the question of, is it true or not? Is it true that CMRI leadership uh, uh, permits people to go to SSPX masses? Yes, because before it was a conspiracy theory. So if you look at the first uh, all the <laughs> conspiracy on, theory, <laughs> if you look at all the responses to my first Twitter uh, on Twitter, all the responses on Twitter to my first articles, this is a lie. This is a mendacious lie. Stephen Heiner is a liar. True restoration of no credibility, except then Bishop Pergrunas then responded and basically said that I was right. And then suddenly the conversation shifted to uh, why is he creating division, et cetera. Uh, people sometimes have to do this. And it switched into defense mode. But it never, ever, none of the clergy who responded, and I answered all of their responses in my third and final response, dealt with the, is this, and they were trying to, people would say like, well, they say it's not a mortal sin. It's like, that's not how I go through life. I don't go through life saying, well, since it's not a mortal sin, I'm going to do it. And so then I, I posed the question, is it a venial sin? So if you're, if, if the big qualifier is it's not a mortal sin to go to mass with the SSPX, you're like, well, is it any kind of sin? Because if it's not, then it's virtuous to go. And they, no one would take, no one would take my bait that I was leaving there or, or the issue of uh, prudence. I said, I'm, tr- I, I, I'm not even dealing with the matter theologically. I'm not going to argue a theological matter with the priest. I'm just saying as a, as a layman, as someone who spent my youth going to conservative Novus Ordo chapels, hunting them out. Could you imagine taking your child to a chapel where, fa- where father says, blah, 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 holy father, this, and then your nine-year-old kid goes, daddy, who is he talking about when he said the Holy Father? I thought we don't have a Pope. And now you're going to teach your child to disrespect what a priest says from the pulpit. This is the scenario that is being promoted by these priests. So I, I'm arguing just on a prudential level, just on a practical level, why would you encourage people to go and take their children where they're going to have to face contradiction? This is not what we signed up for. And it's also signing them up for this idea that what you need to be saved is the Mass. And you don't need the Mass to be saved. You need the faith to be saved. That's why the Chikata always said, you can go to heaven without the Mass, but you can't go to heaven without the faith. And I can't think of a surer way to destroy the faith than to take people to Utaku Masses, which will be serviced by SSPX clergy who are malformed and be surrounded by SSPX laity who are poorly catechized. This, what do you just say, Stephen? I just wanted to. I just wanted to jump personal, in. It's not a personal insult. It's just the facts. Right. That's all. So I, I'm quite new to it. I agree with the non unicum position. Don't go to to that non uh, to that unicum mass. Um, can you imagine the battle weary Catholic is like, okay, I've got out of the Nova Sordo, got out of SSPX. What now again? There's another theolo- So it's it's people are. are like maybe if you could just what is the elevator pitch for that? I mean, like the explaining to I, someone. I, I I think it is unreasonable for people to think that they're going to make it through this life without conflict. I it might be that I just finished rereading King Lear for the third or fourth time in my life, and that effectively is a family conflict that 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 becomes a cosmic conflict, a, a conflict for the nation, and a conflict for let's say the greater universe, and that Shakespeare is trying to make a point about, which is. There are times when you have fights with your family over nothing. It, 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 people, everyone who's listening to this, they have had family conflicts, which were the stupidest things ever, non-theological things. These are people who raised you, who changed your diapers, who, who you've taken to the hospital, who you've sweat and bled for, and they can suddenly turn on you. And, 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 and be, let's put the shoe, shoe on the other foot. We could turn on them as well. This idea that because I'm Catholic, I am free from conflict. Who told you that? Show me where it says in the catechism that there will always be peace. And I, mm. I refer sowing back to... Sowing division. Sowing division is, is a theme that I hear a lot. Oh, don't sow division. Don't sow division. The reason I found it so compelling it is, is just for the simple fact, and I agree with everything you just said, is if I got so far with my family to try my best to figure out everything that I can about this, I mean, this is like the last, I mean, obviously it's a very still, I'm not treating it like it's a small 1%, 2%, it's a major thing, but it's like, why wouldn't you want to keep being curious and not worry about the, 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 the ripples that are going to happen by this investigation? But, and yet there is a lot of, uh, you, you can get roasted on Twitter and people say, oh, this is a 90s innovation, is a, 
It's something that His Excellency Bishop Sanborn cooked up, you know, <laughs> or, you know, that yeah, sort of thing. They, 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 they can say whatever they want. But again, it goes yeah. back to read it. Is it true or not? And our, our Lord said, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. Right? The idea that, yes, oh, you know, that's you're, a you're, major. You're, um, yeah. You're, you're, you know, you're sowing division. Our Lord said, came to sow I, division. <laughs> I'm not trying to sow division. I'm simply trying to enunciate the way that I, I live my life. If you have problems with it, please mm. show me the facts. But if you want to argue okay. with me, I, I would get these desert island scenarios, lay people and some clergy emailed me yeah. and said, Stephen, what if, what if, okay, hypothetically, this is the desert island scenario. Someone uh, is in mortal sin. And they're about to die, and they read your article, and they conclude that they can't go to an unicum clergy, and then they die in mortal sin. Do you want to have that on your soul? God forbid. And they said this in this very dramatic tone. And I just, I sort of laughed. So they never heard thought, of perfect contrition. <laughs> and well, the idea that I'm now responsible for a soul being damned simply because I said, Catholic doctrine. That I'm intellectually yeah. consistent. Please show me where I should attend the Mass with unicum people. And then I often refer back to, to history. Particularly uh, here in France, we have the issue of the juring priests and the non-juring priests, and we have the instructions from the Holy Father about avoiding people who were juring priests. And these were these were validly ordained Catholic priests, but they'd taken mm -hmm. an oath to the constitutional church, and as such, they were to be avoided like the pestilence. But for six months, because back then there was no internet, there was nothing going on, so you you could have without fault or sin, have attended mass with the constitutional clergy before the Holy Father wrote his response. But when the Holy Father wrote his response, it became impossible for you to do so. Now we can argue the Holy Father hasn't ruled on this issue. However, in the absence of the Holy Father ruling on this issue, we have to look at common sense. And as I say, I'm never making the theological argument here. Father Chikata has already made that. And I think mm -hmm. he's made a compelling argument. I'm making the prudential argument. Is it wise to put in your family's mind that attendance at mass is the great value in life mm. rather than the faith? And is it wise to subject your children to contradictory messages and to put yourself in a position where you have to contradict priests? Is that the position you want for yourself? If so, then, then please attend the Unicu mass and you'll have a great time. For me and my house, I would never want to do that. Uh, Stephen, could you talk about um, Father Martin Stepanich? Because uh, he, he was mentioned in, as, as, and I, I read, I think I read his article. Um, I'm no theologian, of course. But uh, what is, right. what, would, what would Bishop so, Sanborn say to, to Father Martin Stepanich's uh, article? Or Father Chicago, I, don't want to, I, I don't want to say what Father Chicago or Bishop Sanborn would say. But if you read that article, and you read what he's saying, he is not defending that you, he's not prescribing that you should go. He's simply trying to argue for why it might not be a sin, right? It may not be a mortal sin, which is something I think the Bishop Sam Warren Father Chicago argue for. And again, this relates to your knowledge. One of the conditions of mortal sin is you have to know it's a mortal sin, right? So I'm not accusing people who go to Unicum Mass of sinning mortally. That's not my job. And as I said, I'm not making a theological argument. But mm -hmm. I think Father Martin, the best that he would argue is that it's not a mortal sin to go. And I am not, I've never gone out in that territory to, to make that. I'm not arguing. And as I said, I don't live my life that way. I don't live my life on the edge of mortal sin and say, mm, is it a mortal sin or not? Then I'll do it. It's like, that's not how you stay live life. far away. Yeah. Stay far but, away. Yeah. Stay, stay far away. And as I said, no one's ever answered my follow-up question. Like, so is it a venial sin? You know? So even mm -hmm. father Martin's article doesn't address that. It just says it's not a mortal sin. That is not guidance. You know, it's like there's a sign at a cliff, like cliff drops off. Right. Uh, so say, well, does the cliff drop off 20 meters or does it drop off 40 meters? Well, you're not going to go up. Would you go to the edge of the cliff and, and, and double check? It's a crazy idea. So the idea that, that, quote unquote, it's not a mortal sin is guidance for you to go is, mm. is seen to be taken that way by a, a significant number of faithful. And as I say, we are still to this day the minority position. It's also the same in France. So it's not just the United States thing. There are a majority of... Uh, of, of French faithful, and this is outside of the IMBC. The IMBC is the the priests I attend mass with, where they are very they're very staunch non unicum Same with the RCI, uh, SGG. But there are a number of French faithful who attend with independent priests. And it's totally fine if they if they need mm. to. They'll they'll go to mass with the SSPX. And, mm. uh, I think that's absolutely crazy. Well, uh, Stephen, we've got so, a bunch of topics I do want to bring up because they are very interesting. And, and, and let's talk about the Western Schism. This might be very interesting for people who 
who are just curious about the whole set of Acanthus position, period. So uh, I didn't know about it. And could you explain what happened there and what we can draw from that as a conclusion that might maybe help us understand the present situation? It's interesting you bring this up because the last time that I expostulated on this at length <laughs> was, was in St. Mary's about this time last year with a number of my in-laws family. So one of my in-laws has uh, two SSPX priests and like four SSPX nuns in their family tree. And one of my former St. Mary's College um, colleagues, we went to school together. She very, I think she knew she was throwing a grenade, but she was okay with it. She's (laughs) like, okay, so Stephen, when, you know, when are you going to come to mass with us or something along the lines of, well, do you think we're sinning by going to mass or whatever else it was? <laughs> and I gave her a look like, you know, I'm in someone else's house. I, you know, you don't, you don't walk into someone's house and say like, Hey, I'd like to start a polemic with you in your own right. house. Not and I could yet. tell, <laughs> I could tell that the mother of the house wasn't entirely pleased with this because I don't think that you want common sense coming out of my mouth for people to agree with. But I took it as a gentle entree, like, okay, uh, you know, you ask a question, I'll answer. And I went, I went the historical route because the question is, well, Stephen, do you think that we're sitting? I said, no, I think that you're in good faith. I think that you really, I would never question that you are doing what you think is best according to your conscience and for your family. I have to accept that at face value. I don't, I don't go around assuming this is sort of diamond brother strategy Anybody who doesn't agree with the Diamond Brothers is a bad is a bad will, right? Um, and then they'll they'll have a video made about them about how a bad will they are, as if the Diamond Brothers can look into people's souls. And so I have to assume that people I interact with are the assumption is that you 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 have good will that you're acting from from position of your conscience. Wait a second, so that's, say, a, that's a that's a very important point that you just made. That okay, thank you for that. That was just a very good point. You can't go around assuming people are, are you know just. Well, you, well you, you, you can if you're the Diamond Brothers, but the rest of us, I think, <laughs> would prefer, prefer, prefer to go from the Catholic position, which is you don't assume someone is of bad will. You don't assume someone is in mortal sin. You don't assume bad things about their character. A lot of people do that. They, a lot of people do that. Um, and, and they're welcome to do that. It just It's not a Catholic teaching. It's not anywhere that they can produce that, but that's a, a Catholic way mm. to act with people. And so, uh, and so when, I, when I started the exposition for them, I said, I'll give you an example of why I think this is okay. And I went to the Great Western Schism. And I said, this was a period unforeseen in church history for which the people in that period did not know how they would get out of the scenario they were in. And so a brief sketch, and you can go into this on Wikipedia. And if you want, Father Trauner and I did a series called The Councils on Restoration Radio. And we went into much deeper depth with depth with names, dates, and specific happenings, but the back of the envelope sketch I'll give you is that a Pope was elected. And remember that for some time, the papacy had lived outside of Italy. It had been in France. And so St. Catherine of Siena and others had persuaded the Popes to finally come back to Rome. And, but that didn't change the fact that a number of Cardinals were now French and had a certain love for France, etc. And the Pope that was elected managed through his personality and antics to alienate a certain number of cardinals who then went and had a separate conclave and elected a different claimant. Mm. So you had two different claimants and, and I, I give the fiction of the, not the non-fictional, but the, the, I'm setting the scene. I live in some little town in France. There's no internet. And on one side of the town is the church that has a bishop that's allied with the Roman claimant and another that's aligned with the Avignon claimant, or let's say the the uh, the French the French backed claimant. This continues for years, which meant that people were born and and if they were young, they died. If they you know infant mortality was a real thing. People were born and they didn't know who the Pope was. And keep in mind, the Church hadn't ruled on this matter, so there was no certainty. So if we had, had internet forums, could you imagine there'd be the the the, <laughs> oh. the, 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 the Roman claimant like you guys are all heretics. And then there'd yeah. be the French people. And of course, the French who think that they're right about everything. You know, I always say one of the ways you have to understand the French is that God has programmed them with, with a, a recording in their brain that says, I am French and I am right. You know, so if you, <laughs> if you understand that this is, this is how the French are, that you can really understand all of their actions and the way that they think. 
And so here are the French, they're going to be writing about how their claimant is correct. And then you have people like St. Vincent Ferrer, who are backing mm. the, the French claimant, a doctor of the church, the angel of the apocalypse. And God, <laughs> so the people would say like, oh, well, you know, Archbishop of Lefebvre was so holy and that's why it's right. That is not, that is not the answer. You don't use someone's personal holiness mm. in order Ooh, to make an intellectual argument. Stephen, you are dropping you, bombs. <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't say wow. so-and-so is really holy and that's why he's, he's right. And so the angel of the apocalypse, our Lord did not see fit to let him know what the state uh, was regarding these two claimants. And so you had a bunch of intellectuals in the church who thought, okay, how are we going to get out of this situation? I know a general council, let's call a council and then we'll elect another, except the other two claimants refuse to abdicate. So now we have three claimants <laughs> and no certitude from the church as to who is correct. And so this was only solved later on by both a courageous a courageous pope and uh, one of the other claimants who was willing to back down another claimant didn't and we have a, a cardinal we have we have a claimant finally in Martin V who is accepted and it, it still takes a while and there's still some after effects of this in which now the 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 after effect is people see the councils as the super solution to church problems so once mm -hmm. the problem of the pap once the papacy is attacked, the papacy now looks weak, and so we have this this rise of conciliarism where councils will now tell popes what to do. Well, this is an error from thinking that because we solved the Great Westernism by, by the mechanism of the council, that that was the only way it could have been solved. It isn't. Those, those could have abdicated and they could have peacefully accepted a new claimant, but it was mm -hmm. it was a path. So people tend to look and say, since it was solved this way. That was the only way it could be solved and say there were Catholics who lived and died who didn't know who the Pope was. And I think this is the other thing I try to tell people is we live in a post-Tridentine era. And so what, what does that mean? That means that we live in a time in which the church is centralized, where it has clear operating manuals for everything. I don't, I don't want to um, trivialize this, so please realize I'm only using this term analogously. Mm. But yep. let's say the church was a startup. In the early centuries, mm. you didn't have the College of Cardinals, you didn't have canon law, you didn't have catechisms. We didn't even have published Bibles. We just had scrolls that were passed around to different churches. Right. So over time, things get centralized, things get clear. Prior to Trent, the way that you could become a priest is you could go effectively, just as you do at NT, you could go apprentice with a priest. You went and lived with a priest for a couple of years, learned some Latin, learned some things, basically went on sick calls with him, and then you apprentice to become a priest. There, there weren't seminaries everywhere. Hmm. We as Catholics in a post-Tridentine so era, that is so in, interesting. In, a, in, in a post Tridentine <laughs> era, we think the way that you make priests is they go to seminary for seven years, they study philosophy, then they study theology, and they're ordained in minor orders all the way through, and then they become a priest. And you're like, yes, that is one way you can become a priest. And that is particularly the case for those of us who live in a post-Tridentine era. But go back to people before the scapular, Catholics, and try to explain to them what the scapular was. Go to people before Our Lady gives the rosary to St. Simon, to, to St. Dominic, and try to explain to them what the rosary was. So the idea that because this is the way that we do it is the way that Christians, I said, no, our, we live in a very recent era of the church with all sorts of benefits and blessings, right? So underneath, I've got a St. Benedict's medal. I have a miraculous medal. I have a, mm. I have a scapular. I have all these extra helps that Christians didn't have for centuries before me. In fact, the vast majority of Christians who've died did not have access to what I have access to. Mm. I have access to the miraculous medal. I have access to the scapular. You're talking about 1500 years of people who didn't have access to these things mm. or, or more, mm. right? 1800 years of people who didn't have access to the miraculous medal. How about first Friday promises? How about first Saturday promises? The, the, the wealth of stuff that I have access to as a Catholic. And then to think that this is how it is. No, right. this is just how it is now recently and so if you understand that and you go back and you study our fascinating church history then you'll realize not only is this just the latest crisis this mm -hmm. idea of like it's unprecedented and all this like mm, to an extent somewhat it's unprecedented but but if you go back and read the history of like the early councils where popes were being drugged by their beards from altars mm -hmm. in greece and in asia minor and then the altar falling on them and them being killed or you know, monks having their uh, beards lit on fire during the iconoclast crisis and icons being smashed. Like nobody's going around smashing icons now. 
So this idea that things are unprecedented, that every age has its own crisis, ours especially fitted to our screwed up philosophy and screwed up ways of living in our technocracy. And so our crisis is adapted to that particular time. But if you read church history, you, I find an incredible consolation. I think, oh, we're just in the latest crisis. Our Lord is sleeping in the boat. And we're desperately trying to wake up our Lord. Lord, don't you realize that the, you know, the, there's a storm going on as if our Lord doesn't know. And people are like, <laughs> oh, when, when is this crisis going to end? And my question always is, what have we done to merit the end of this crisis? Are we so holy that our Lord's like, wow, I just can't stand this holiness. I've got to fix this situation for these holy people. We or certainly we haven't been holy. That's for sure. We can, right. we, that we know. That much we know. This, soci- this okay. society okay. has well, not you, been holy. You, yeah. Okay, you, you, you're, willing to, you're willing to answer for me. But this idea yeah. that we just, that we're entitled to a Pope and we're entitled to things. Like, who told you that? Who taught you that? Okay. If you, if Perfect. you, if you, Steven, read, your, so this if you is, read your church history, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think that. All right. So time is short. And we should get into this because I think we've already done so much. We talked to SSPX, we talked to CMRI. Let's now talk about <laughs> let's talk about totalism and thesis. And um, I, I want to also get into Holy Week. And we should have gone back to marriage and all of this, but, but let's just leave that for now. Let's 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 talk about um, a totalism and thesis because I think that's that's very important. Let, it's, well, it's, let, it's let's important. Do, let, let's do Holy Week first because it's okay. next week. For, for us as we're recording this. Yes. And yes. Uh, this just goes back to the comments that I'd said earlier. There's plenty of stuff online about it. Father Chicada has written and created videos about it. Um, so I would refer people, go and read all that stuff first and yeah. try to attack the truth. Don't try to attack your feelings and defend the congregation that gives you mass and say, well, because they're so holy, they must be right. Say, it's okay. People can be wrong. It's okay for people to be wrong. It doesn't make them sinning. That the uh, And I've said on Holy Week particularly that I'm willing to accept the CMRI argument. I think that this was something that would have to go to arbitration with the Holy Father later on. The Holy mm-hmm. Father, if we have a restored church, then we would have a Holy Father say, rule on this issue. How was the conduct? What was the correct way of giving? Well, would it, would it be I, a mortal sin to recognize and resist Pious, no, no, uh, you, Pious the Twelfth. No, no. You, uh, no in, fact, it's the, in fact, it's the opposite. It, you, it is a Catholic right promulgated by a Catholic Pope. You cannot say such a thing. So um, you you commit no sin by attending the so called reformed liturgies of Pius the Twelfth. It is a Catholic right. You cannot say anything against it. It was so to by not. A Catholic so, Pope. But then again, then the flip side to not do it. Then wouldn't that be a mortal sin? You're 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 disobeying the Pope. No, no, because it's a question of, and I would use a military analogy, and the same applies in church teaching, which is if you have a situation in which, let's say you're told to guard this hill, okay? That was your last order. My order is I'm, I'm guarding this hill. And then you receive no orders for 60 years. <laughs> and it seems that the sounds of battle have moved on. And you look over the hill and you don't see any enemies. And you're thinking, but I was told to guard the hill. That was the last valid order I said. Our Lord also believes in this thing called common sense. And it is this idea of applying norms of common sense to uh, against what church positive law is. So you say, okay, well, the Holy Father said this. It's true the Holy Father said that. He did. Do you think that the Holy Father would approve the new mass? Because if you if you look at the the, the, the analogy, it's like, Yes, it's a Catholic rite. It was approved by Pius XII, but would he have approved the Novus Ordo? No, he wouldn't have. And so this Holy Week is inside the Novus Ordo almost unchanged. Mm. So part of why people resist it is we think with all that we've learned, it's like sitting and saying, I'm going to guard this hill and now 50 years have passed. So yes, uh, Pius XII told us to do these changes. And you could have accepted it reasonably within some time period after, but now so many years have passed you think, no, we're going back. And that would be the explanation you would give. We get court-martialed by our commanding officer, or in this case, the bishop. I think I would be in good conscience be able to say, Your Excellency, we had no orders for 60 years. This is the Mass that, as it was done. We also want to do to the Holy Week as it was done in that time period under Pius X. And so we're, we were sticking with that. I have a reasonable explanation as to why I'm doing it. And the people who promote the Pius XII Holy Week, I think that they have a reasonable explanation for it as well. I would put it to... It's to be decided by a future Holy Father, or mm-hmm. if the, the final yeah. judgment comes first, by our Lord. In a sense, I, I think that the, the priests have argued, and 
you know, go and go and draw your own conclusions. But you cannot say that it's a mortal sin to attend the pious. Defo- that's a ridiculous statement. Mm. And you, it's a Catholic rite. It is permitted to be attended. It's just that there are problems for anybody who studied the new mass. Uh, the Pius XII yeah. uh, reforms are riddled. And if you look, Pius XII did things and then retracted them. He, he issued a Psalter, which two years later he pulled back. He authorized the Chinese. Oh, I didn't know that. Mm. And two years later he pulled it back. So mm. this idea that, well, maybe two years later, Pius XII would have removed this Holy Week. So this idea is that since he did it and it was the last thing he did, that it would have continued for a thousand years. We don't know that. There were a number of things that were done that were not permitted. If you go back to, is it the Council of Constance? Um, I might be wrong on the council, but uh, the Eucharistic cup was permitted for Czechia, Moravia at the time, because there was such division from the Lutherans. But it turned out that the Catholics had seen that as a point of division. So they refused to use the Eucharistic cup, even though it was permitted to them by indults. And so then it faded from use. So the church permitted people to receive the precious blood as Roman Catholics, and the people had not asked for it. They didn't really want it. And so it was, the adult was removed after a couple of years. And so the idea that if the church mm-hmm. does something, therefore it's always going to be done. The church can remove something. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think that that's the implied position of the pre-55 people is that if, if I were to be questioned by a future ordinary of my diocese or by the Holy Father, I would have a reasonable argument to give. And I think mm-hmm. that the Pius XII people have a reasonable argument to give as well. So that's mm-hmm. why I don't, I don't push back as much as I do on Unicum. I don't think Unicum mm-hmm. is a reasonable argument. Like, oh, I have to go to Mass. Like, show me where it says that. Show me where it right. says you have to go to Mass in order to be safe. But um, as far as the Pius XII Holy Week, I can understand why some people would make that. Mm-hmm. That's why I, I've said publicly that I don't have a problem with that. Let, let's end off uh, with uh, the Kessis Siakam thesis and, and totalism. Um, I mean, all, again, these are tough issues. And I, I, I really commiserate with people, you know, you just get out of the Novus Ordo Foxhole, then you go into the SSPX, and then there's that's, another, that's, yeah, I, it's I just another, that. it's one thing after the other, but here we but are, that's, and that's it's life. something we have that's to deal life. with, that's, yeah. That's yeah. the spiritual, that's, that's the spiritual battle as well. When you get to a mountain, you know what's behind it, another mountain. I, yeah. I just read um, St. John of the Cross's Dark Night of the Soul. Uh, if you think you've made progress in the spiritual life, get ready for the Dark Night of the Soul. And because that's different from spiritual desolation. Spiritual desolation is sent by the enemy. Dark night of the soul is sent by our Lord. It's something to try and push you. And, and trust me, uh, from reading this beautiful poem and, and St. John's explanation, it's, it's, it's a tough thing. And so this idea, who, I would always ask Catholics, who told you that? When they think like, oh, I'm supposed to have peace, consolation, no problems. Like, have you read the book of Job? Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe go ahead and read that and then tell me about how you're supposed to be entitled to a bunch of peace and and uh in unity right and i would maybe, for maybe people to can, announce- shall, I, shall i frame it so maybe like um so the rci and the imbc take the position of the thesis and that that lineage comes from to, bishop Ger- gerard delorier yes yeah. to to a slightly different extent in that the imbc requires their seminarians to adhere to the thesis before entering and the rci seminary does not to this day doesn't okay. require it, even though there have been accusations leveled at it. I always refer back to the interesting story of the two French priests, the two RCI French priests who are now back here in France, uh, Father um, Henri Chapeau de la Chanoni and Father Damien Dutertre. They were in France, and so the easiest thing would have been them to go to the Italian Institute Seminary. It was mm-hmm. just, it's next door, Italy's next door. They can come home on vacation to see their family. Instead, <laughs> they choose to yeah. go to the United States uh, with a bunch of English speakers. And uh, they'll tell you it was because they didn't accept the thesis at the time. And so they couldn't enter the seminary. They wanted to, quote, unquote, escape the thesis. And they are, oh, they are wow. hardcore. I didn't know they that. Are hardcore, they're hardcore thesis holders now. But they mm. didn't even hear about it until, and I think I think Father Duterte will tell you he heard about it after his first year. And he asked Bishop Sanborn about it. And he said, let's talk about it after you finish your your two years of philosophy, because it will, it will make more sense then. So the idea that Bishop Zanborn and the clergy there are out proselytizing for the thesis flies in the face of fact. It also flies in the fact that Father Nkamuke, soon to be His Excellency Bishop Nkamuke, will tell you that he was taught, and Father Chikata always taught, that there were different solutions to the crisis, an imperfect general counsel, the idea of totalism, the idea of the thesis. So we basically have competing theories which will have to be arbitrated by a future Holy Father. We're once again in territory which cannot be, which cannot be um, resolved by lay people or even by clergy. 
And so I always refer people, go to Bishop Sanborn's document on a thesis, and he concludes by saying, hey, we're open. This is just a thesis. This is one explanation that we have. And if the totalists have an argument, we'd love to hear it. And I haven't, I, I can't say that I've, I've But I mean, read, Stephen, uh, uh, this, the, the intellectual, uh, I think that that discussion is, I think what really got people was his, ex his Excellency Bishop Dolan was quite vocal about being against it. And that started off a sort of chain reaction. Yeah, but that, 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 that's only recently. So those of us who have known him privately and yeah. have known over the years have known that he's quite opposed to it for, for years. Mm -hmm. um, but Father Chicada, what Father Chicada was a diplomatic check because Father Chicada right. taught at the seminary and Father Chicada was once again the, I'm not a thesis guy, but I don't think it's the work of Satan, right? So every mm -hmm. anyone who tries to argue that is dishonoring, not only dishonoring the legacy of Father Chicada, but they are, they're doing what Father Chicada never did. Father Chicada never denounced the thesis. Father Chicada mm -hmm. never called it like, uh, you know, um, uh, what is it? Saw sophistry. You know, some of some some people refer to mm. all these crazy names. Well, Listen, I think debate, the, uh, debates the emotion, the debates the emotion, the church, the emotion heated. Right, right. Yeah, well, it, new, it really. certainly got uh, really charged. I think in the newsletter, um, essentially, he was saying he was more th that their specialties. For instance, Bishop Dolan was more in pastoral theology. Yeah, and they would tell they would tell you that they would tell you. Uh, I, I think um, there's an episode in which Bishop Bishop Sanborn. I asked him a question. Like, oh, that's a that's a Bishop Dolan question. And this happens in marriages too. People specialize, right? So he he said Bishop Dolan is in the devotions department. Father Chicot is in liturgy and canon law, mm -hmm. and I am in charge of condemnations, right? So mm -hmm. it's a you, you go to a department store. You if you want the but condemnations, they got a, you go. To but a lot of people got upset because they were they were, the 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 way that they perceived yeah, but that's it was just, that that's that just not that's just not honest because there are numerous times that I can personally tell you I asked Bishop Dolan a question. And he said, "Oh, that's a Bishop Sanborn question. I don't know. That. That's a deep theological question." And the idea that priests are supposed to be good at everything is a crazy notion. Why would we have specialized seminary professors if priests were good at everything? Why do we have specialized missionary priests or priests? Why do we have priests that are in um, monasteries that are uh, Carmelites and, and, don't, uh, and don't come out into the world? We yeah. have specialization within the church. It is not an insult to say that someone wasn't at a, a top level theologian. Right. It's just not. And it also flies in the face of the fact that that person said to me personally that he wasn't. He said, oh, that's right. a Bishop Sanborn question. And the, all of those clergy, if you put them into a room, they would say that. And so people want to be insulted because they need to be right, because they're uncomfortable with ambiguity. This goes yeah. back to what I said about Holy Week. I, I agree that it is uh, capable and worthy of debate, and I don't have a final answer. Catholics mm -hmm. want, I want a final answer because that's how it normally works in our faith. But there were things that were not final answers for many years. The assumption was open. Immaculate conception was open. Could you imagine being at the times like, I'm an immaculate conception person. And someone's like, I'm not. Well, it wasn't defined by the church. So you could have been both. And so the same thing, the church hasn't ruled on the thesis or totalism. And so anyone who's trying to claim that either is the way, uh, I, they may be zealous for both. And I'm not doubting their, their zeal. But it's just not it's just not honest to say that this has been resolved because it hasn't right. been. For me, I hold a thesis. The true Restoration doesn't have a position on thesis because obviously we work with clergy from 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 all sides of the, mm -hmm. the argument. But personally, I, I do because it, for me, it's an explanation of why the church is in the state that it is now, where you have people who appear to be office holders who are not, who are wearing the clothes in charge of the properties. And so, and the material formal thing is not only Thomistic, but it makes sense to me personally. I just uh, think it's, it's very, the I idea think it's of a very president sad. elect yeah. and, a, and a priest yeah. and, and a pope elect. And, and, and I, I understand all those analogies and it makes sense to me. But the reason I'm not saddened by it is because people substitute um, these as phony wars, like the way that people get excited about Republican and Democrat stuff or, mm -hmm. or politics, that these are substitutes for a deep doctrinal or spiritual life. That is the question. Um, yes, I want to listen to you lecture me on totalism or the thesis, but can you tell me what the definition of a sacrament is? And I would argue that a lot of these Twitter people, if I if I were to able to have them in true life, could you explain to me what the definition of a sacrament is? Something that you're supposed to be able to define in order to receive first holy communion as a as a Catholic. If you can't tell me that, I don't really want to listen to your expostulation on the thesis or totalism. And I'm talking about lay people, obviously. I know that our clergy know. Um, mm. But it's really the lay people who've made the most hay about this. But I think the, the, the thing is a lot, 
the, there, there are, and as with His Excellency, uh, there was was quite hostile to the thesis at um, close to his passing. It's very sad that it ended acrimoniously with Bishop Sanborn, and that was mentioned in the newsletter. Um, and they were they knew each other what fifty years? I mean, a really long time, and and. I can understand so that people back, have this disagreements. This goes back to a theme that I've talked about. You know, you have disagreements with It's like two family members things, having things, a serious things, disagreement. Things, things happen. We don't say like, oh, it's not impossible for family yeah. members to fight. Of course it is. I always point out that, um, that there are these, I think it's in um, Philemon, the book of Philemon. Or it's one of the uh, epistles of St. Paul. But he says, please, Evodia and Syntyche, keep peace with And you have to realize these people have um, been immortalized in scripture for having a fight. And St. Paul had to <laughs> intervene between the two of them. Could you imagine? And they're not saint. There's no saint of Odia and saint Syntyche. But he, <laughs> that at the time of the apostles, he had to write a letter and say, please, ladies, stop fighting. And this was this is now preserved for us. And so when people are like, oh, you know, peace, unity. I, I said, in the time of the apostles, there was no peace and unity because we're humans. We sin. And so stop having unreasonable expectations of life, of the church, of each other. And just realize there's going to be conflict. There's going to be ambiguity. There's going to be difficulties. But this all points back to the answer, which is prayer. Prayer is always the solution to this. You ask our Lord what's right to do in your life, and you pray for everyone else to save their souls as well. And that's where, and study, prayer and study, those are the, the, the two things that are going to lead to progression on these other issues. People use this as a substitute for being Catholic. So people like to read about the latest doings of Francis, or they'll like to um, get involved in the latest arguments or polemics. But that's not, uh, that's not the Christian life. The Christian life is not polemics. The Christian life is a relationship with our Lord grounded in the sacraments and uh, an act of acting lovingly towards everyone around us. That is the, the, funda the fundamentals of Christianity and yeah. and, and sometimes charity <laughs> sometimes love and charity is not always roses and flowers sometimes you can you can have sharp I, was it um St Paul and St Mark there's a sharp kind of <laughs> oh, St Paul St Paul and Barnabas and Barnabas yeah there's a, there's a, a tell you, didn't want to travel with him or someone or something <laughs> I don't remember what it was but um I understand well Stephen I I think I know you have to go so it's been a real pleasure I mean you're really you're like so so wise to talk to. I mean, you've you've been, you're kind of like it. You're like so many years ahead of me. I can I can kind of see in some ways. I see you as a much more advanced version of myself um, in in the in the as a layperson. And uh, it's really um, a pleasure to speak with you. I, I really gained a lot from this. I encourage people to please check out True Restoration, and you can follow Stephen on Twitter. And uh, Stephen, should we end off with any um, final messages for uh, for the viewers? I think just to recap some of the stuff we've talked about today, remember that there are going to be disagreements, but always come from a position of understanding that don't assume bad will in your internal. Oh, that's assume, the best. Yeah. Assume, yeah. assume so, that they're coming from a position of following their conscience. So yeah. once you have that, then try to argue from a position of facts, try to argue from church teaching and just keep going with that. And if they don't have that, say, well, I have to end the argument for now. I want you to go, if you'd like to go and study that and I'm hey, happy to resume this, but I can't have a, I can't have an argument with someone about Vatican II if they've never read the Vatican documents. Mm -hmm. I can't have an argument with someone about the thesis if they've never read Bishop Sanborn's short 10-page mm -hmm. um, PDF on the thesis. Mm -hmm. I mean, just go and read it, and if you want, we can have a discussion after that. But unless we have a baseline, we can't have a reasonable discussion. But I will always start that reasonable discussion with the idea that you are following your conscience. I won't ever assume otherwise, unless you give me reason <laughs> to believe that you, you, you are not. Well, the great Stephen Heiner, uh, thank you for all the work you do. I know you do actually, you know, people should understand he do, you do a lot of important work behind the scenes and for the for the Catholic faithful. And um, you're, you're just a, a very important person, uh, just really from the work that you do. And thank you for True Restoration and all the, the many years of creating the binge, the binge material for all of us. <laughs> uh, we are binging and um, thank you so much. Please come back again soon because this was great and I feel like we could have gone longer. Maybe we can bring on some other people. We can have a fun panel. There's a lot we can chat about. So the great Stephen Heiner, everyone. Stephen, thank you thank so much. You. Thanks so much for your time.